So uh, we're very happy to have the second talk of the afternoon by Arun, um, uh, Arun Debray from Purdue University, who is going to tell us about twisted string boardism and a potential anomaly in E8 cross E8 heroic string theory. Arun, please. So thank you so much for having me, first of all. And thanks for being accommodating, even though I wasn't able to make it in person. So let, I'll go ahead and get started. I'm going to talk about a couple different things. So the main result is a combination of two things. First, there's a method of computing some boardism groups. And then there's the computation itself, which has applications in string theory. So first I'll talk about the context of why one might be interested in computing groups of invertible field theories, which are determined in terms of boardism groups. Then I'll talk about the specific application I have in mind, which is a, one of the two heterotic string theories. And then I'll talk about the method of computation. So there's sort of a standard package for computing these things. You know, I like to think of it as a machine. You put the, you put the question into a box, you turn the crank, the answer comes out. Well, it turns out that machine broke for this problem. It doesn't, simply doesn't work. And so I'll talk about how to fix it. And that involve, well, that involves proving a whole new theorem. And so that's, that's joint work with Matthew Yu, who is at Perimeter. And so I'll talk about that when I talk about the methods of computation. Just to check, I have until 35 minutes past the hour or less or more. Like what time does my talk end? Sorry, in uh, 42 minutes from now until 3.35, okay. sorry. No worries. Okay, that works. So what I'm going to do is heuristically state the, the sort of two main theorems. And then I'm going to say them more precisely later. So the, 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 this is the computational result. And one way you can think of it is there is a way to calculate twisted string boardism groups even when the usual story fails. So there's always an atom spectral sequence over the entire Steenrod algebra. But one would like to, for twisted string boardism, one would like to do something simpler, where you work over the subalgebra A2. And it, a priori, this seems impossible, because you don't have a splitting. But the theorem is that for a much more general class of twists, it is in fact possible. That's the, so that's the first result, and I'll state it more precisely later. The second result is the application. So there, there is a, there, there's this, amongst the string theories that the physicists discover, one of them is called the E8 cross E8 heterotic string. So a long time ago, I had written investigated the question of anomaly with the question of is there is there is there a particular invertible field theory in dimension eleven? It is is it zero or not? The physicists would like it to be zero. So Witten, uh, based on calculations of Robert Strong, argued that this is in fact zero. So this is not exactly the most general version of this question you could ask. If you take into account a Z two symmetry which swaps these two E8 bundles, then the... Well, computing the anomaly seems to be pretty difficult, but Witten's argument doesn't work. There, the, uh, the group of field theories is non-zero, so there is an anomaly cancellation question for this heterotic string theory, which, it, which was uh, not thought to be true. So, like I said, later we'll get to the precise versions of these results. So what is an anomaly? If you ask a lot of, if you ask different people in mathematical physics, you're going to get a bunch of different answers, more answers than people. So heuristically, 
and I think this is more agreed upon, that an anomaly is a mild inconsistency in a definition of a quantum field theory. So you're setting up a quantum field theory, however you do that, you know, different, different perspectives lead to different answers. And as part of the way of doing that, you have to check, oh, a priori there's an anomaly, it might be non-zero, but we need it to be zero. Well, okay, depending on what exactly you're doing. But for the, the anomaly that I'm going to talk about today, related to a string theory question, it, we would very much like it to be zero. So there's different perspectives. The one that I'm going to adopt is that an anomaly is saying that you're not, your field theory is not defined absolutely, but it's a boundary to a theory in one dimension higher. So Fried Telemann had this article called Relative Quantum Field Theory, which describes it from the perspective of uh, functors on boredism categories. So, okay, like, like I mentioned, the, a field theory is a functor out of a boredism category. This, this part is a little heuristic, you know, that when I say a boredism category, you know, maybe it's geometric, there's definitions of geometric boredism categories. There's, you know, a lot of this stuff is not completely settled as to what that is. So when I say, a field theory is a functor out of a boredism category. You know, this definition in various settings can be made precise, and in other settings, I want to leave heuristic. So an invertible field theory, well, okay, C has a tensor product. So we can consider the functors which factor through the subcategory of invertible objects under, te under um, tensor product, invertible morphisms, under composition. If you have higher morphisms, we'd like to look, land in invertible higher morphisms, etc. So if your field theory factors through this, then it is invertible. This definition is due to Friedmore. Ah, okay, I said that. So there's different ways to look at it. One concrete way to think about it is, okay, partition functions as elements of the, the very, very top of, of C. You know, typically we take these to be complex numbers. And invertible means they should be non-zero complex numbers. State spaces are tensor invertible vector spaces, so they're one-dimensional, and so on. So one way to think about this, if you'd like, is that these are things which are almost but not quite trivial. And a lot of examples come up for this reason. When people study invertible field theories for applications to like SPTs in condensed matter physics, many times it's because they want to study arbitrary topological phases, but SPTs are the easiest ones. And in the application today to anomalies, well, people study non-invertible analogs of anomalies, but sometimes, well, sometimes we study uh, the invertible version simply because we got to start somewhere. So there are classification field theorems for reflection, oops, sorry, for various kinds of invertible field theories. So the one that we need today is the one for reflection positive. So why reflection positive? This is the width rotated version of unitary. And so if you're studying a problem coming up in physics, probably it came from a unitary quantum field theory. And so the, the anomaly theory ought to be unitary as well. So we should study the, well, the wick rotated version, which is reflection positive. So what does the classification look like? It's expressed in terms of homotopy theory. So you take a Tom spectrum, and then you take its Anderson dual. And so, concretely, what this means is that instead of looking at borders and groups, you're looking at borders and variants. And there's, the Anderson dual puts them together in a certain way, but I'll say that in a sec. So, when I said mt xi, the specific, uh, xi is the data of a tangential structure. So, spin, string, whatever the structure is needed to define the data in the theory. So one caveat here is needed to define the topological data in the theory. So for example, if you have like a connection on a principal U1 bundle, you should forget about the connection. There are various ways of making this precise. But the point is, you, uh, you, if someone hands you a theory, typically it's a math, mathematically precise question in applications, what psi is? Because it's about the data that enters the theory. So Fried Hopkins theorem, is a theorem for invertible topological field theory. So they classify, in addition to this, they say, well, which things are topological? 
and it is a conjecture for non-topological ones. So what is their classification? So here's the thing we want to classify, reflection positive and vertical field theories. There's the subgroup invertible TFTs that are reflection positive. And this is given by torsion bordism invariance in the same dimension. Then there's the quotient. So this should be thought of as the, the part that's non-invertible, or sorry, non-topological. So it, it is not the group of non-topological invertible field theories, but it's the quotient by the group of top, inver, uh, topological invertible field theories, everything reflecting positive. So these are in one dimension higher, bordism invariance, and the partition function is the corresponding secondary invariant, like trans, uh, classical transignment theory. So this group is a group of characteristic classes, typically. And in physics, sometimes people call it the, the uh, image of an invertible field theory here. If you're thinking of it as the anomaly theory of something, then this is called the anomaly polynomial. So um, that, that's a word that will come up again. So I'm going to talk about a specific application, which is to EA cross EA heterotic string theory. There are various different kinds of string theories. I'm, I'm interested in heterotic string theories. They're 10-dimensional. Their low energy limit is 10 to n equals 1 supergravity. This doesn't characterize them. That's, there, there's some additional stuff, but this is sort of how I, how I think about them. So n equals 1 means there's supersymmetry. There's not as much as there could be. So if you set up a string theory, there's the question of what are all the fields? What's the data that enters the string theory? So if you're studying anomaly cancellation, this is, this is useful for writing down what psi is. So the first thing you notice is this supergravity theory includes data of a group. So we, we fix a group. It should be, it should be a compact Lie group. So in supergravity, there's just... Um, supergravity is different than quantum field theory. There's this uh, sum over uh, different possible like, space times, so different, you know, different manifolds in, in some way that I, as a mathematician, don't quite have access to. But the anomaly cancellation question takes place before, that, before performing that sum. So I'm going to sort of forget about that part of supergravity, and we're going to think about the anomaly as a field theory, even though that, you know, that, that's sort of an ingredient in the final story, but then the final story might look quite different. So there's this keywork of Green and Schwartz, who showed that the... So when, when you want to do anomaly cancellation, again, before performing that sum, there is the anomaly polynomial in general is non-trivial. And so in order to vanish, well, first of all, G is extremely restricted. So there's two options, EA cross EA, spin 32 mod Z2. And when I say this, I don't mean SO32, one of the other Z2s. So you can pick, there's two other choices of Z2s in the center. You pick one of the other two, and you get this, this isomorphic groups. So we're not going to worry about this one today. We're going to worry about this one. So the way the green forks cancel the anomaly polynomial, so remember, this is saying that the image is trivial, which means that it pulls back from some invertible TFT. So we haven't canceled the anomaly. We've just mostly canceled it. So what green forks do is they establish a relationship between the gauge field and a higher gauge field called the B field, modeled as a gerb with connection. And the upshot of their work is that the tangential structure of space-time is something like a strange structure. So the details depend on the specific theory, but it's going to be something much more like a, how a strange structure is built out of spin. So how does that go? Well, H4 of B spin or B spin N contains a class, which is typically denoted 1 half P1 or lambda. And uh, B string is the fiber of lambda thought as a map to KZ4. So a string structure is a spin structure together with a trivialization of lambda, much like a spin structure is an orientation with a trivialization of W2. So a typical output of the Green Schwartz mechanism in some you know, theory of quantum gravity is there's a class, there's a characteristic class for the gauge group. And anomaly cancellation says, okay, you start with spin manifolds, you start with the principal G bundle, and now instead of trivializing lambda, you trivialize lambda minus that characteristic class. So 
it's sort of a twisted string structure. So part of the question involves finding mu. So in the tangential structure, just like a uh, string is the fiber of lambda, we're looking at something which is the fiber of lambda minus mu. So the green force mechanism, we started with a unitary, we started something unitary, so we're going to get reflection positive. We, we are looking at anomaly, so we're going to get something uh, invertible. And because we canceled the anomaly polynomial, we get a topological field theory. So, the, so we're looking at uh, Homs from omega n psi to c star. And remember, this is one more than the space-time dimension. So what this means is you can compute these Bordism groups. You know, this is a math question. What is this group? What are the Bordism invariants? And we can learn about the anomaly this way. If you're lucky, the whole Bordism group vanishes, and then you're done. But sometimes the result is more interesting. So for the um, E8 cross E8 heterotic, okay, the, uh, the space or the group that we look at, so BG, is the classifying space of E8 cross E8. And so the big question is, what is mu? So E8 bundles have a characteristic class in degree four called C, which is the, gener the generator of this group, canonically isomorphic to Z. And so we take e C for the first copy, C for the second copy. So Witten used the fact that this map, C, thought of as a map from B8 to KZ4, is strictly connected. So in string theoretic uh, dimension, we might as well work with KZ4. So then spit out by Grange fourths is equivalent to spin cross E8. So the idea is set C1 equal to lambda because you can let it be arbitrary. It, might, it can be an arbitrary degree for cohomology uh, class and then C2 is force. So, okay, spin boardism is much easier than twisted string boardism and Robert Song showed that the relevant boardism group is zero. So without having to know anything more about our theory, the anomaly vanishes. So E8 cross E8 heterotic string theory passes this consistency check. So now we get to this kind of curious sentence. The gauge group of the E8 cross E8 heterotic string isn't actually E8 cross E8 because there's a Z2 symmetry which swaps the two E8 bundles. So this isn't automatic. You have to look at the data entering the theory and you observe that it's symmetric under this swap. It's, you know, the representations that the various particles are in, but it is. And so the gauge group is really E8 cross E8 semi-direct Z2, where Z2 switches the two factors. So unfortunately, well, okay, so fortunately, green force just works. The anomaly polynomial is still zero. In some sense, that story takes place rationally, and the presence or absence of a Z2 doesn't introduce any new problems. But what Witten did really requires, you know, that argument requires you to break the symmetry. You know, if you saw on the, when, when we talked about it, C1 and C2 play different roles. So we can't do that. So in other words, there's a question to ask. When we include the Z2 swapping symmetry, what is the anomaly? Is it trivial? We would like it to be trivial. Because string theory ought to be consistent. In other words, string theory has passed a very large number of consistency checks. So if, it, if this is not trivial, that's kind of a problem. It indicates a misunderstanding on our part. So I did not compute the anomaly. This seems, uh, this seems to be a little more difficult. But what is true is that the Bordism group is non-zero, so there is an interesting computation to be done. And um, so I'll report on how that goes. So it's sort of the first step in this computation. So, okay, the Bordism groups are harder to compute because they're twisted string Bordism groups. And not just twisted string, the standard technique fails, and we had to develop an alternate technique. So before I... Oops. Before I go into the details of the computation, are there any questions? Questions? Oh, thanks. Questions? No questions. Okay. Thanks. I'll go ahead. So I'm going to talk about the details of the computation. So there's this standard technique. 
and it doesn't work. And how can we fix it? So once I have that, I'll be able to talk about the um, the fixed computation. So you know, here's this, here's the E2 page. Here's here's what we learned about the answer. Here's what's still unknown. Oops. Oh, I see what's going on. Um, okay. So there's a bunch of borders and computations in the mathematical physics literature, often for the purpose of studying anomalies or SPTs or sometimes McNamara and Vafa's cohortism conjecture. But the specific computations themselves tend to follow a pattern. So in most examples, there's some sort of auxiliary tangential structure, and it's typically spin. Although it may be oriented, it may be spin C, it may be string. And the steps are going to be the same. So first step is you have your tangential structure you want to, you want to study. And... You say, okay, well, this is really the same thing as a twisted string structure in the following sense. That a psi structure on M is the same thing as a vector bundle on some auxiliary space, a map to X, oops, this map is called F, and a string structure not on TM, but TM plus the pullback of that auxiliary vector bundle. Um, yeah, so for example... Let's say that we had, you know, I was thinking of X as BG. Let's say the, the green schwartz mechanism spat out that you want to trivialize one half P1 plus one half P1 of a spin vector bundle on X. Um, I think I didn't say that, so let me clarify that. So green schwartz says, okay, in these, you typically get lambda plus some class. And so the, the question is, is that class lambda of a spin vector bundle? Let's assume it is for now. Chase that to the Pontrag and Tom theorem, and you get that your spectrum, whose homotopy groups are the bordism groups, is string bordism of something we understand. And this thing is about as hard as X. So, okay, this is string bordism of this Tom spectrum, X V minus R. And now we have tools. We have Tay Hertzbrook, we have Adams. And Adams has a change of rings theorem that makes this computation much, much simpler. So if you just do spin bordism, then you may have seen the fact that you can work over A1. So there's many examples of this in the literature. Um, this really nice work, uh, Agnes Beaudry and Jonathan Campbell wrote up a nice sort of primer for doing this. And so this is for spin. For string, we get x over A2. So there's, again, it's, it's harder, but it's not too, too bad. And there's this nice work of uh, Brunner and Ragnus that just did a bunch of examples of this uh, that came out like two years ago. They don't talk about physics, but they do a bunch of nice out of spectral sequence examples. The point is, this thing is really a routine. The calculation itself might be hard, but the method is very, you know, do this, then do this, then do this, then do this. Okay. But there are lots of examples where it looks like they ought to work, but it turns out they actually don't. And so this crucially includes the E8 cross E8 heterotic string with the swapping symmetry. So the gauge group is actually E8 cross E8 semi direct Z2. So um, what happens? So in twisted string examples, you say, okay, I have the green Schwartz mechanism, everything works, but the class mu that you get out is not one half P1 of any spin vector bundle. And if you're thinking, well, what if we considered non spin vector bundles? That doesn't actually help. So, you know, we don't have to worry about spin here. The point is, this doesn't work, and, you know, you can just check, you just don't get lambda. So, there are, uh, there's also spin examples if, if a lower height example is. Um, Easier, there's, there's a couple gauge groups where W2, sorry, uh, where a degree two cohomology class that you might want to be equal to W2 of some vector bundle isn't. So in these problems, you always have the atom spectral sequence, but the atom spectral sequence in direct, just sort of attacking it directly without change of rings, without passing to A1 or A2, it's pretty bad. Even in, so, Physicists and mathematical physicists get to take a shortcut that they only care about things up to dimension maybe 12, 13 at most. 
in these sort of uh, super string theory problems, but that's still high enough that it's going to be a headache. So now I'm going to tell you something that is a very, you know, very hypothetical thing. Hi, sorry. Can I Let's just... Yeah, go for it. Uh, so can you just say a couple of words about uh, why should, should we consider this Z2 symmetry as a gauge symmetry and not like a global symmetry? So why is... Oh, you're saying why should we sum over that Z2 symmetry? Yeah, like why? Why do you? Con I mean, I understand uh, what you mean by Z two symmetry, but uh, I don't really see why you're describing it as a gauge symmetry as opposed to um, a, a global symmetry. Ah, that means that I uh, spoke wrong, because it is a global symmetry. We're not gauging over it. So the the the, the fact that this tangential structure is it's going to be something like the spin cross. E8 squared, so, oops, uh, the wrong, that semi direct is the wrong way. And then there's some sort of string two group there. And then this is C1 plus C2. So this is the tangential structure that we're looking at. And the point is that it includes data of the E8 squared bundle and a Z2 bundle. So we're checking this anomaly before we gauge anything E8. And so when we throw in Z2, we have not gauged the Z2 yet. And so therefore, um, there's no need to, like, I think the right way to say it is this Z2 is a global symmetry. We're, we, we're not gauging it, and this Bordesman computation has not gauged it, or does not correspond to having gauged it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks for asking. Were there more questions? Uh, yeah, hi. I would have a question about this middle point. Um, so can you say something? What is known about this question? Which um, four classes are the lambdas of spin bundles? Sure. So there's this thing called the Dinkin index, which what you do is you say, okay, for a, for a group G, um, let's say compact. Probably I need to say like compact, simple, simply connected. And so this is the minimum of the following. So you consider all representations into SUN. And so you say, okay, well, what is, so the minimum value of the absolute value of the pullback of C2. So why C2? Because um, that's the, so if you look at compact simple simple connected G, H4, of BG is canonically isomorphic to Z. That includes SUN. So you might be thinking of this as this map, uh, rho star in H4, is a map Z to Z. So what map is it? So we look at the minimum of all of these. And so, OK, if you want to look at spin N instead of SUN, well, OK, you can complexify. So now we're looking at the, you know, the sort of the real version of the Dinkin index is like we, we might get a factor of two in this minimum. So maybe we should do one half. And so the point is that this is computed. For G, compact, simple, simply connected, we needed E8 cross E8, semi-direct Z2, which isn't, but you can bootstrap the computation for E8. Um, I learned this in a paper of, um, uh, shoot, let me uh, Laszlo and Sorger where they, they state the co computation for all uh, compact simple simple connected G. And a couple of their computations are new, and I, some of the others may also be older. So for example, for E8, you get 60. Or wait, it, OK, it, it might be 30. So I don't remember. But we need it to be like 2 in order for this E8 cross E8 example to work. And 30 is a bit bigger than 2. So um, you can just look up in their paper what all the answers are for G compact, simple, simply connected. And then the others you can usually prove by, like, just sort of building on that. Okay. 
Well, I, I think it wasn't quite my question. I mean, given a, oh, class, so given a class mu, how do you tell that mu is not lambda of a spin vector bundle? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, sorry. So, so the point of this Dinkin index business is that if, if you have any... Um, so if you have any representation of G, you get a vector bundle. And so the Dinkin index says, okay, well, what's the, which cohomology classes can be, uh, can be, which cohomology classes are C2 of a representation? Then you say, okay, you know, one half Dinkin obstructs lambda of a spin representation. Then there's a Tia Siegel to obstruct lambda of a vector bundle. Because a Tia Siegel compares, you know, you can think of a Tia Siegel as comparing the rep uh, which vector bundles, or at least which classes in K theory, come from representations of the group. So um, in the end, it's um, so the Dinkin index thing is strictly a minimum. This process that I described here, you might lose some information, but it still gives you an obstruction that says, okay, if you're, if mu in BG, or sorry, in H4 of BG, if it's less than, say, 15 times the generator for E8, then you cannot realize it as lambda of a vector bundle. Is that what you were asking about? Yes, thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, thanks for asking. Were there any more questions? I think no more questions. Thank you. Okay. I'll go ahead. So if you weren't aware of this fact about Dinkin indices, um, you might do something. This is, this is a complete hypothetical. Where you might say, okay, I'm going to do this computation. I'm going to follow the standard formula. You know, this, this vector bundle surely exists. I'll go find it later, you know, hypothetically speaking. And so you'll make this mistake and run the atom spectral sequence with the simplification over A2 as if everything's split. And then you say, oh no, there is no such V. And then you run the computation correctly. And the crazy thing is, in the end, the computation is exactly the same. So obviously this is not a hypothetical situation. I made this mistake. So I talked to Matthew Yu about this and we decided, so we computed a bunch more examples mostly twisted spin, but there are, you know, including twisted string examples. And we decided to say, okay, well, what's going on? Why is it exactly the same? And so this is, this is the magical thing. This problem exists. You can't use the old formula, but in the end, you get the same answer. And that, this was kind of wild. So we're going to get at this thing another way. And the other way is the Ando Blumberg Geppner Hopkins res or ABGHR approach to Tom Spectra. So they, they build on work of Maypo and Ray Turnahave, and ABGHR construct this, uh, this topological abelian group, GL1R, which is, you can think of as the classifying space of rank one free R modules, so R lines, local systems whose typical fiber looks like R. So associated to a, such a local system, they define a Tom Spectrum. And so it's an associated bundle construction where you take your principal GL1R bundle, you take your ring spectrum, you smash them together over uh, GL1R. So strictly speaking, there's some issues, like there's a bunch of technical issues making this precise. So saying that P is a principal GL1R bundle is not quite right. It's a, it's a vibration. But you, you end up getting a Tom spectrum and it agrees with the usual Tom spectrum definition when you... Uh, when you start with the vector bundle. So there's a way to recover the Tom spectrum of a vector bundle out of this. But this is much more general. So we're going to be able to describe a uh, twisted string board in this way. Specifically, so Ando Blumberg Gebner constructed a twist of TMF by classing KZ4. And so that comes in a, uh, as a map from KZ4 to this uh, classifying space of GL1 TMF. So uh, you can lift this across the sigma orientation, which I think is Ando Hopkins res, 
And you get a twist valued in KZ, uh, from KZ4 to twist of M string poison. So what you get a corresponding Tom spectrum, which may not have come about as the Tom spectrum of vector bump. What is it? And the answer is that the Tom spectrum of this, of this twist, so let's say you twist by mu, or uh, mu and then lambda. Uh, I should, this should be mu and not f, sorry. So it turns out that this Tom spectrum is equivalent to the usual Tom spectrum that we got by taking the fiber of lambda minus mu. So in other words, um, by, by taking mu and then this way of twisting string bordism, Abgar style, you get the bordism spectrum for spin manifolds with a map to x and a trivialization of lambda minus mu. So now we have another description. The second component is Baker Lazarev's atom spectral sequence internal to the category of R module spectra. So how do you do this? You work with, instead of cohomology being maps from M to HZ2, you work with maps of R modules. So this must be an R module. And so there's actually, um, we need, there's a, an assumption I forgot, pi o r is z or z2. But this is true of all the examples we consider today. So instead of working with cohomology, you work with sort of r module cohomology. So you look with maps of r modules. And instead of working with, oh no, um, instead of working with the Steenrod algebra, which is h star of hz2, you work with r module uh, cohomology operations, which we're going to call AR. So Baker Lazarev then produced an atom spectral sequence, and it looks exactly like the usual one, except we're working with cohomology operations over R and R module cohomology. Great. And then, okay, in nice situations, it converges to the two completions of the homotopy groups. Fine. So, in other words, we don't have to work over all of A. We've changed rings to AR. Is this helpful? Who knows? But at least it's something interesting, indicating the change of rings theorem ought to exist. So that's a good sign. Okay, we wanted to twist empty string. This thing seems messy, and determining it in complete generality probably is harder than determining string boredism, which is in fact open. So we need another way. Specifically, let's base change to TMF. So we're going to take um, MTXI, which is M string module, tensor over M string with TMS. And so it turns out that because the endo hopkins res orientation is 15 connected, so that means that M string looks like TMS in low dimensions, namely the dimensions rel relevant to string theory. So if you're if you care about string theory applications only, you don't you can basically only work, work with little TMS. So we can replace MTXI with the corresponding TMF module Tom spectrum. And as far as string theory is concerned, the homotopy groups are exactly the same. So the Borzen groups we want, we can get by looking at this thing. And that's good because ATMF is nice. It's a subalgebra of the Steenard algebra generated by just three classes, square one, square two, square four, the usual thing we'd use for change of rings. So change of rings is nice. Just like for the uh, recipe that didn't work in this case, we can compute the E2 page over A2. And this is much easier than working over all of it. So the last step is to say, okay, well, in all these examples, what is the A2 module structure? And the proof is, okay, compare with the universal case, which turns out to be empty spin, and we know the cohomology of that. So for reasons of time, I'll skimp on details. So the theorem that uh, Matt and I proved is, let's say that you want to study borders and groups for the tangential structure, where you trivialize lambda minus the pullback of mu. So let's... Instead of looking at the cohomology of x, let's modify it so that square one and square two act the same, and square four acts according to this formula. You take uh, square four of x, and then you add u times x times mu mod two. So this looks similar to the formula you get in the vector bundle case. So the first fact is this is actually an A2 module. You have to check the atom relations. The second thing is the atom spectral sequence computing this bordism group is x over e2 of t of mu. So the whole point is we can work with a2 of 
and we could be x of this specific module. So this is pretty tractable. Oops, um, where this is where I was. So you can also do the same thing for twists of spin and spin seabordism. For twists of oriented boredism, it's trivial. And you can do this for twisted string boredism at p equals three. In the remaining cases, so higher, like larger primes or spin and spin seabordism at p equals three, this is kind of trivial. There's, it's, uh, you can, it's, it's usually good enough to work with other methods. So that was the first main theorem. And now let's actually look at the EA cross EA heterotic. with uh, Z2, swapping symmetry. So the computation is, it has gone from incredibly hard to just involved. So you use theorems of Nakov and Evans and Quillen to compute the E2, uh, e A2 module structure. And then using the theorem that Matthew and I proved, you get the A2 module structure on TMF module cohomology. And this is actually something that you can do in general atom spectral sequence computations typically require computers, even in dimensions up to 12. But you can do it by hand in this case. So a combination of looking up things that already exist in the literature and then doing, you know, just doing things that techniques that appear in Beaudry and Campbell's paper. So that's nice. So here are some pictures. This is the A2 module structure. So what is there to say? Each of these classes is a different sum and. Um, this one, this one, and this one. They give you a copy of MT spin splitting off. And this one, it looks like MT string smash BZ2. So that doesn't split off, but it almost does. And that's good enough to kill a bunch of differentials. So in fact, here's the E2 page. Here's dimension 11. Notice we've got six summands, and it looks like there might be differentials. So there's there's quite there's stuff to do here. So I mentioned there's 62 sums on the 11 line. It looks like there could be differentials, but it turns out that you can kill them without doing anything fancy. So the first thing I mentioned to empty spin splits off, that kills a lot of differentials. Then there's the standard technique of, okay, I don't understand differential. Let me map it to or from a differential that I understand. That kills differentials to or from most of the orange things. And then there's one more thing you have to do, and that you do by computing the boredism group into, uh, sorry, you find a generator in dimension 12, and that implies that a certain differential has to vanish. So no fancy techniques. I should also mention what's going on at P equals three. Um, here's the ATMF module structure. And here's the E2 page. So in this case, there's nothing in dimension 11. So we don't have to worry about three torsion at all. And then P greater than three, is even easier. So the theorem is that this boredism group, again, HE means the, this particular heterotic string, uh, twisted string boredism group with the Z2 swapping symmetry. We were, we were, I was unable to determine the extension, but it is order 64. It's, a Z8, uh, it's an extension of Z8 by Z8. So there can be an anomaly. Uh, and so this is, this is something that you know, would be good to know. But on, so probably to do this, it'd be good to have more information on the Borson group. So right now, what do we have? Resolving this extension is difficult. And, you know, just I've tried some things. That I haven't tried everything, but everything that I know how to do hasn't worked. And finding generators also seems pretty difficult. So, one of the, so the Z8 uh, subgroup is generated by bot cross RP3, on which the anomaly is trivial. But further information on generators, the place where the anomaly is most interesting, this seems difficult. So that's, I'm out of time, and that's also all my slides. So thanks so much for, uh, for listening. Thanks so much for having me. And please let me know if you have any questions. <clears throat> Great. Thank you very much, Arun. <laughs> Further questions for Arun? So on the last part, on this result, have you thought about interpretation of this? Or maybe that's the point of the first um, triangle there? Uh, interpreting this um, from a physics point of view, let's say. Yes. So the physics point of view is, you know, if you asked a bunch of physicists, is the EA cross EA heterotic string anomalous? Mm. You know, with the, with the standard caveats that we're looking at, we're really looking at the supergravity uh, low energy approximation, and before we summed over space times, um, they would say, no, Witten did that in the 80s. But there is this additional symmetry 
And it turns out that there might, the anomaly is not a priori zero. And, you know, someone should go check it. And so when I say someone, I would like to do that, but it's, it seems hard. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just planning on writing this up and then returning to it later. Mm. Like writing it up with this theorem and returning to it later. But this question is now actually back open. Is there an anomaly? Mm. Now, string theory has passed a large number of consistency checks. So this anomaly should be zero. Uh, there are string dualities. So physicists know of ways of interpreting this in different string theories. And so there's a question of, okay, does this correspond to some other thing that physicists know is trivial? And so we better check this to make sure that that, that like to provide another consistency check on string theory. Because the consistency check we thought we had was actually missing something. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's an interpretation. I see. Um, and related to that, so you mentioned the general strategy in the beginning that if you cancel mm -hmm. anomaly uh, polynomials, then you're sort of given a TFT, right? Was that the idea? Mm -hmm. So do, yeah. uh, is there a prescription what that TFT is, or do we not care? Uh, is there anything that unpacks that for us? Um, so it depends on the data of the theory. Mm. And so, for example, the TFT, it's a tensor product of invertible TFTs given by the different dat uh, data in the theory. So, for example, if you have a fermion transforming in a representation of the gauge group, mm. then that representation has an eta invariant, and that eta invariant lifts to an invertible field theory. So part of the data of canceling the anomaly polynomial is saying that when you tensor all of these field theories together, you get a topological field theory. But then other fields may contribute other anomalies. So I think in the E8 cross E8 case, there's an additional term. Um, but I, this is something that someone told me, but I don't know too much more about it. I see. So in principle, one can work out that TFT. Yes. Right. So there's this really nice example uh, Freed Hopkins, I think it's called consistency of M theory. Um, All right, yes. All right. Mm -hmm. So they work this out really nicely. They do an even harder out of special sequence computation. Mm -hmm. And, um, but the point is, they say, okay, we have these fields in um, the low energy approximation of M theory. And under the time reversal symmetry that M theory has, these are their anomalies specifically this invertible field theory and this invertible field theory, and then they compute it. I so that's a, this is a really nice example mm -hmm. of the kind of like perspective and technique that I am trying to apply to heterotic string theory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you. Any mm -hmm. other questions for Arun? Urs? Hi, hi, Arun. I would like to come back to the previous question by Hisham and then relating to what Alonso said. So Alonso was asking whether you, you're not actually gauging the Zemo 2, right? right. So the, the question is, you're doing something that hasn't been done before, you say, oh, okay, now there can be this anomaly. But I guess Alonso had a point there in saying that usually we don't quotient this out, and I said, okay, it remains a global symmetry, but, but you seem to be considering cobordisms that are equipped with this C8 times C8 mod C2 structure, right? So in particular, there can be a non-trivial Z mod 2 bundle now on the cobordisms, mm -hmm. right? And that is, to my mind, what it means to gauge the symmetry. And that is, I think, not what one usually would consider. For instance, if you embed the heterotic string into um, Hojava Witten theory, then one E8 lives on one boundary of the end of the world, and the other E8 lives on the other, and they are very right. much, very much not thought to be symmetric. In fact, in all heterotic model building, one of them is in the dark sector, as people say, and the other is the gauge sector. So you just very much distinguish between them. Of course, one can probably do other things, but 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 I think the standard approach would not have that Zemo two symmetry, I think. And, yeah, phenomenologically, definitely, that's what you want for building not, a center model. Not locally, right? I mean, you're, you're, you're Lagrangian, I think that was your point, it's invariant under this, but you, mm -hmm. don't, you don't want your solutions to be, I think, well, I mean, the usual story, you don't want non-trivial Zemo 2 bundles, right, which would correspond to these two copies of E8, right. uh, sorry, uh, like changing. And you say that locally you know that this one is the left and this one is the right, but globally they might switch. Yeah. And, that's yeah. Your, and your point is that in phenomenology, you don't want them to switch. Well, Is that right? I, yeah, I just mentioned right. the phenomenology as, a, as an additional data point, but I think okay. just conceptually, Alonso was right that like not every global. Yeah, I don't know. So I guess this is a, this is actually a crucial point to maybe clarify here, right? When you're making this claim that you might have discovered a missed anomaly in the heterotic string. Well, I haven't discovered the missed anomaly yet. I'm just like the anomaly might be zero. I would like it to be zero. 
Sure. But there's something to check here, and that's what I discovered. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I think fair enough. All right. Right? So, uh, I mean, modulo what the interpretation of this would be. Yeah, one can check whether it's zero or not. Um, mm -hmm. Right? Other questions or comments? Okay, if not, let's thank Arun again. Thank you so much, Arun, for the nice talk. Thank you all for your wonderful questions. And for yeah. listening. Well, it's good to see you virtually. Hopefully, we'll see you in person mm -hmm. next time.